Hello, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Cam, and welcome to another video in our series Learning C Sharp. This video is a continuation of the previous one in which I explained how to work with bitwise operators and what they are. And in this video, I would like to do a bit more of a hands on on a few examples of how bitwise operators can be useful. So in this video, I'm going to do three examples, three practical examples with bitwise operators. The first one is going to be very simple. It's just going to be figuring out how to calculate if a number is even or odd instead of using the modulo operator using the bitwise operator. In the second example, I would like to show you how from a uh, an integer representation of color, how to extract the red, the green, the blue, and the alpha values, which is actually an operation that I happen to find, I happen to do very often in the kind of workflows that I work myself in computational design. And last but not least, I would like to show you also how with bitwise operators, we can create these things called masks, which are very, very useful when we have a situation where we have multiple things that can be true or false and where we have to respond differently to all the possible combinations of those things being true or false. This is particularly a case, for example, when we are designing algorithms such as marching squares and marching cubes. This technique is particularly useful. So without further ado, let's, yeah, let's just do it, okay? Bitwise operators hands-on. Let's do it. Okay, let's get started. So the first example that I would like to show you is how to use bitwise operators to do a very common operation that we do very often, which is figuring out if a number is even or if a number is odd. So the way we would do this without bitwise operators is to just have a number, right? And then what we will probably typically do is use the modulo operator to figure out if the remainder of dividing that value with a number two is either a zero or a one. And if it's a zero, it's an even number. And if it's a one, it's an odd number. So if I run this code here, you can see that yes, this is false. Or if I am a little more verbose about it, I can just say is the val is value is even. And then it says false, right? Because the modulo of this number and two is equal to one. Okay. Well, in bitwise world, we can do a very, very similar operation because at the end of the day, if we have any number and the number is represented in binary, remember that each one of these numbers represents a power of two, right? And it's, I don't, I actually don't know if this is the value of 191, but what is very easy to see is that if we want to basically figure out if a number is even or odd, the only value that we're actually really interested in is the very, very last digit. And if the very last digit is a zero, then the value will be even. And if it's an one, then the value will be odd. So with bitwise operators, what we can do is we can perform an operation where we clean up every single other bit of the number that we're not interested in, and we just keep the very, very last value. And therefore we generate a new number that will be zero or one, and which we compare to figure out if it's an even or a not. So what we can do is we can say, well, what about this? What if I were to take this number and do an and, a bitwise and operation, where I basically take every one of the bits and I do an and operation with the decimal value of one, all right? Which is all zeros, and a one at the very end. If I do an AND operation bitwise, you can see that no matter whatever the values at the top were, when they get AND with the value of zero, they're always going to cancel out. They're always going to become zero. So zero and zero and zero, zero and zero, one and zero, zero, one and zero, zero. So whenever you AND with a bit zero, it always turns into zero. So we're basically canceling out all the information that we don't need. But then, at the very last bit, if we add that with the value of one, then if this is zero, the result will be zero. But if the above is one, then the result will be one. 
So by ending, this sounds awful, by end in the original value with the value of one, what we basically do is we cancel all the bits that we're not interested in and we end up with the one bit that tells us whether if it's even or odd. In this case, if the result, the remainder is one, it means that it's e odd and if it's not, it's zero. So the way we can do this is we can just rewrite this in bitwise form and say is even is going to be equal to the value, right? And then ending, where is this? Uh, ending, if we end this to the value of one and then we say, can we take this and is this equal to zero? And if that is equal to zero, then the value will be even, otherwise it will be odd. So is 191 even? It's not even. Is 190 even? Yes, it is even. Is the value of blah, 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 blah even? Yes, it is even. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be only eight bits. Okay. Beautiful. How was that? The second example that I would like to go over in this video is one that I find myself using very, very often, and perhaps it's my secret agenda for this video to explain this one, which is channel extraction or color extraction from an integer that represents a color. Let me, let, me show, let, let me first explain what that means. Uh, depending on which programming environment you're working in, maybe you have some way of defining color as a data type. So maybe, for example, in C-sharp, if we bring in the system drawing library, then you have access to the color struct, which you can use to construct or to create colors, for example, from ARGB. So in this case, I am creating a color that is fully opaque and is RGB 191, 127, 63, which I don't even know what color that is, but it doesn't matter, right? So maybe you can create colors like that, or maybe you are taking or you're reading colors from an image and you're taking them in this format, in the color structure. But then what you're interested in is in actually figuring out the individual value of each one of the channels. So you just want to know given the color that you have, that you want to know the alpha value, you want to know the red value, the green value, or the blue value, right? Depending on where you are, you may have access, for example, to these properties here, which just give you right away, given a color structure, they give you ARGB, okay? Which is fine, and you can use them to extract, you know? But if you're doing this very systematically and with tons and tons of values, depending on the structure that you're using and how heavy it might be and what functions are underlying these accessors, it may actually be a little expensive. In C Sharp, it's not too bad, but I've worked in other environments where uh, getting the green or the blue or the red of a color using functions is actually very, very slow. And if you're doing this for the full image for every pixel, it just takes a lot of time to do. So one thing that I would like to introduce you is the fact that very, very often in memory, when we want to store a color that has four channels, it's a very, very common way of representing this color as an integer. What? Okay, let me show you that. So if I create this color with these properties and then I do this thing where I say, can you from this color give me the ARGB value? turns out that this returns a 32-bit integer value. And if I print that to the console, it turns out that color 255, turns out that it's like minus 4 million 2027, blah, blah, blah. Why is that? Well, it turns out that storing four values that can only go from 0 to 255, storing them in one integer that is 32 bits long turns out to be a very, very efficient way of saving this in memory because you're basically not wasting a single bit of memory. That means that, uh, what that means is that the way this happens is that what we can do is that if we know that each one of the values is just 255, 256 values, what we can do is we can pack the zeros and ones of each one of those channels consecutively in a, in a value that has 32 bits. 
but we just put the zeros and ones one after the other in this structure. When we put these together, they turn out into, they become this like unintelligible integer that is very difficult to extract meaning from. But what we know is that the zeros and ones that represent the alpha, the red, the green, and the blue, we know where they are, we know in which position they are, etc., etc. It's just that when, when they're combined together, the integer that they inform is something that is very difficult to understand. But it's a very fast and very efficient way of packing this information. So I have found myself very often in the position of having a color that has been stored in memory in a database, transmitted from an API or whatever, store in this kind of 32-bit integer representation. And I, was, I needed to find an efficient, fast way of just picking out the red, the green, and the blue. So how are we going to do that? We're going to use bitwise operators because it's by far the fastest and most performative way of doing that. So how does that look like? Well, let's imagine we have the 32 bits of that integer, okay, represented as... A, the, sorry, let me say this again. Let's imagine we have the four colors packed in zeros and ones into a 32-bit integer, right? And what I'm interested in is in, for example, let's start with the blue color. If I just wanted to get the blue color, then if we follow the example that we did before with the module operator, then it's probably quite easy to understand that what we can do is we can just do an AND operation, a, bit one, a bitwise AND operation with the value of 255. And the value of 255 is basically all zeros and then eight ones which means that if we and the integer with all these numbers, everything that is here is going to be canceled. So that all these digits, when we and them with the value of zero, are going to become zero. And then all these numbers, when we and them with the value of one, they're going to be whatever these values were here. So finding the blue channel is actually quite easy. It's just taking the integer and ending that integer with a value of 255. So let me then rewrite that for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cancel all of this and I'm going to say, I have the integer that I have extracted from color. So can I now compute the blue color by saying, give me color integer and then can we end this value bitwise with the number 255. And let me make sure that this is working. So I'm going to print to the console the value of B, which should be RGB, should be 63. So I'm going to run this and you can see that, yes, we are getting the value of 63, the 63 on there, okay? Beautiful, so that works. So, but what about the other ones? Well, let's say that we now wanted to just extract the green values, correct? Something that we could say is, well, maybe what we can do is I could end the integer, the 32-bit integer with some number that has all number ones here and then all zeros here, and then the rest of the values are zeros all the way here. And then we would end up with the green values over here. But that is probably a good start, but I don't like that approach because we, end, we would end up with a number that has the important digits somewhere here after 8 bits, which is not going to give me a clean number from 0 to 255. It's going to give me a number that is going to be in a much higher order, and I would need to end up translating that somehow to 0 and 255. So that doesn't quite work right away. So what we need to do is we need to actually do a small operation before, where what I would like to do is I would like to make sure that the values that I'm interested in, the values of the green channel, are somewhere in the area where if I end them, they will turn into 0 to 255 values right away without any further transformation. And if you remember from the previous video, we have learned that something that I can do also bitwise is take the numbers, take the zeros and ones, and move them around horizontally in the number. And that is with the bit shift operator. So what I can do is I can say, well, you know what? 
what if I oh this went this came out in the wrong in the wrong layer so what so forget about the, this stuff here so what if I take this integer and I shift all the bits eight positions to the right hand side all these zeros will appear at the front and then the gray values are shifted eight positions the red values are shifted eight positions the green values are shifted eight positions and the blue values disappear there's no wrapping going on here okay and then if I now take those this value and I end this number with the value of 255, then I will be basically canceling everything at the very front and the values that I'm interested in will end up here very nicely in the range of zero to 255. So when it comes to figuring out the green channel, the blue channel and the alpha, we will just need to go through the extra operation of shifting everything eight positions, 16 positions, or 24 positions, and then bitwise ending that value with 255, okay? So, I mean, that's going to be also quite easy to do. So let me show you. So for example, int green is going to be color int, and what we're going to do, you can see that the auto, you can see the IntelliSense is also suggesting that I bit shift this stuff, which is kind of nice not by 16, I'm going to bit shift it by eight positions. I'm going to make sure that I put parentheses to make sure that this goes first. And then I'm going to end this value by 255. So what is green? Is green 127? Let me check that. Yes, it is 127. So now I'm going to copy and paste this for red. And for red, I'm just going to bit shift 16 positions. And I'm going to now print the red value which is going to be 191 as we had made here, which is also good. And then last but not least, what about the alpha? The alpha needs to be bit shifted 25 positions. So I'm going to go here and do be, uh, yes, do that, okay? And if I copy and paste what I had before, so now things are going to be a little cleaner. So my, RGBA colors have been extracted on a per channel basis using bitwise operations. Again, maybe in this case in C sharp, maybe it's not entirely necessary because we have this property which I assume is pretty performative, but I've been in situations where I didn't have that possibility and then doing the integer bitwise approach was much, much better, okay? So, and also it was a really good example, I think, of like all the potential like mix and match of things that you can do with bitwise operators. I like this example a lot. The last example that I would like to explain is perhaps a little more abstract. So I'm going to ask you to hold, uh, pay a little bit more attention to what I'm gonna say right now. But it's an example where bitwise operators are really handy when you have a situation where you have to keep track of multiple conditions at the same time and where you have to respond to a lot of different combinations of those individual conditions uh, one by one. So for example, let's say we have a situation where we have four possible conditions like true or false, true or false, right? And for each combination of those four different conditions, if the first one is true and the la all the rest are false, if the second one is true and there are all the rest are false, if the third one is true, if two of them are true and the other two are true, blah, blah, blah. it's basically you have 16 different possible combinations of all those different conditions and you have to react differently, right? You have to make different things based on each one of the 16 possibilities that you can have. This is, for example, something that comes up for, uh, it has actually ha it has actually come up very recently in, um, in some work that I'm doing with people here from the, from the community, actually. And it's, for example, implementing a marching squares algorithm. When you have a marching squares algorithm you want to create in a grid, you want to basically draw lines that define inside or outside based on the relation of the pixels, whether the pixels are on or off. And because you have, you do it at, with four pixels, those four pixels, each one of them can be on and off, which leads to having 16 different conditions, right? 
So if we were to decide what kind of line to draw based on these 16 different conditions, what we would do is we would, we would basically perform some kind of calculation. So this is hard coded, but we will basically compute for each one of the pixels, whether if it's inside or outside somehow, we would end up with a true or false value. And then if we wanted to respond to the 16 different possibilities, we would have to do something like this when we would have to say, if condition one is true and the other one is false and the other one is false and the other one is false, then maybe that means that we are in this case here. But if it's not, then if that condition is true, that is false, if that is false, if that is false, etc. And you have to do this 16 different times with 16 different permutations of true and false, which as you can imagine, it's not very clean. It's actually quite tedious to implement and for four permutations, maybe it's doable. But if instead of marching squares, we were in the case of marching cubes, which is basically the same thing, but in 3D, then it's not any more 16 different possibilities, it's 256 different possibilities. So writing an if else, if else, if else, with 256 clauses, it's, um, I mean, you would your sanity would be really affected after <laughs> after doing that probably right so it's not great so the way this is done typically is that we use what's called masks to figure out whether if in which condition we are and those masks are typically represented in this particular way so if i can find now the the this one here so for example what we can do is we can say for each one of the conditions, in this case, the corners of the marching squares, for example, square, for each one of the conditions, I'm going to define that each one of the conditions corresponds to a zero or a one in a number that is going to have four bits. What that means is that zero, 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 zero will mean that no pixel is inside of the boundary. One, 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 one will mean that all pixels are inside of the boundary. And then anything in between will be depending on the position of this zero and one, we will be talking about whether if this pixel or this pixel or this pixel or this pixel is on or off. We basically assign one position of the four bit number to one of the pixels, to one of the pixels that has to be on and off. What's interesting about this is that with this nomenclature, what we can do now is that these cases will be amount will amount or will be much easier to trace because we can refer to them by number. So this is case number zero because in binary this is zero. This is case number one because this is binary one. This is case number two because this is the binary representation of the number two. This is case number three because this is the binary representation of number three. This is the case number four. And if we actually go and to the other table, we will probably see that you see four, that is top right corner here. Case number four is top right corner. All right. So basically these cases here are the same cases. It's just that uh, we're doing binary, we're, trans we're flipping between the binary representation and the decimal representation. I don't know if that was clear. But basically, what that means is that one way to approach this problem is to say, well, instead of doing a massive if else, if else, if else, what I can do is I can turn these four conditions that are true or false into a decimal number from 0 to 15 by doing bitwise operations. What does that mean? Let's say, for example, I'm going to cancel all of this and I'm going to say I'm going to create a mask. This is typically the the, the name, the technical name that we give to this combination of zeros and ones that comes from true and false conditions. And I'm going to start by setting the number at the very, very right most of the binary representation. So the first one is going to be, is the condition one, is the condition one, is this equal to true? If that's the case, then the mask is going to start with the value of one and the it's going to and then otherwise it's going to start with the value of zero and if i were to represent this in binary this will look something like this zero b is the way to represent in binary and it would be zero 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 
and then 0, 0, 0, 1, if we use 8 bits, okay? I'm going to remove this space here, all right? Beautiful. Then what I can do is now I can extend that masks with the second condition, and I can say, you know what, whatever mask is, I want you to or this, so that is bitwise or, with the next number that I'm going to compute. And the next number that I'm going to compute is going to be the second condition. Is this true? Yes or no? Then give me the value of 0 and 1. And remember, because we want this condition 2 to be in the second spot of the bitwise operation, on the second spot of the binary representation, I need to shift this value by one unit to the right. What that will mean is that it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Okay? And if I OR that with this one, and if I OR them together, then maybe I get something like da 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 da, and then 1 and 1. If both are 1. If it's not 1, then it will be one of them will be 0 and 1, or 0 and 0, whatever that is, right? And then let's, let's keep doing that. The only thing that we need to do now is the same thing with the third condition. That is the third condition and we need to shift this by two positions and this will be one zero here. And then condition four is going to be true or false and this is going to be. And because we're checking if this is true, we can be a bit more elegant here and just remove this because we don't need that. We can do the shorthand version of that. Okay, beautiful. Let's figure out what have we written here. So if all of these were true, this should probably be the number 16, correct? Because it would be 1111, sorry, the number 15. So let's try that out. And you can see that, yes, we do get the number 15 here. If I were to take the one at the very front and make it false, then this should probably be the number seven. Is that correct? Yes, because I'm removing, I'm removing that if this is, for example, uh, false and false, we only have the very first number. Oh my God. If we only have the very first number, then mask should be the value of one. Is that correct? Let me try that out. Yes. And if I were to do this false and then false, and then false, and then the first one is true because it's in the fourth position, it should be the value of eight. Correct? Beautiful. So what that means is that, and I'm not going to do this now, but what we can do now is that we can write a much more elegant condition where we can say, let me just use a switch where I'm going to use the mask as the condition. And I'm going to say, if we are in zero, or if we are in one, or if we are in four, then do something. Maybe you have three conditions that are the same, right? Or if you are in number two, or if you are in number three, or if you are in number 15, then do something else. I don't know. And then this, this is typically, typically much easier to maintain, to read, to understand, and we're using a switch mask condition here. But if you have a more complicated situation, then maybe the mask is basically the position of an array that has the information for each one of the particular conditions or each one of the particular data entry that you need to perform that operation. It's more like a, like a, like a search table, like a lookup table, more than a conditional statement. Okay, but this is also a very, very common way of working where working with situations where you have multiple conditions and you have to respond differently depending on the combinations and the permutations of those multiple conditions. Again, for example, this is very common when you do marching squares algorithms or marching cubes algorithms. Okay. Beautiful. I think we, I think this was a lot already. I hope um, this was understandable and digestible. <laughs> Thank you for watching this video. If you want to learn more, remember this is part of our series learning C sharp for designers uh, or for anyone in general. There's uh, there's not that much that is particular to designers. 
Uh, and if you like this video, please just give it a like or subscribe to the channel or say hi or share it with your friends or whatever. Uh, it just helps uh, transmit the message to the world. Thank you very much and see you in the next videos. Bye.